Welcome to The Hive Podcast, a new 10-part series with me, Natalina Hai, exploring technology's impact on our personal, cultural and political lives. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud and YouTube and join in the conversation with the hashtag Hive Podcast. If you enjoy the show, please do give us a rating on iTunes as it helps spread the word and makes it easier for other people to also find this content. And now for the show. Dr. Tom Chatfield is a British writer, broadcaster and tech philosopher whose interest is in improving our experiences of digital technology and better understanding its use through critical thought. He's written six books exploring digital culture, the most recent of which is called Critical Thinking. In this episode, we'll discuss everything from philosophy, citizenship and data, to decision-making, biases and populism, and we'll explore how our approach to life and technology may make the difference between surviving and thriving as a species. Tom, thank you so much for coming and chatting with me today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so I love this term of tech philosopher. Can you tell us a bit about what that means? Well, it's quite a nice catch-all term that lets me get away with a lot. <laughs> I guess it really just started out with the fact that my background was literature and philosophy, I guess. I did, did a doctorate in, in those fields, but I was a geek. I played around with computers. And it always struck me that the way people talked about technology this ubiquitous, incredibly important facet of contemporary life didn't have that much historical, cultural or philosophical richness. Mm. And I suppose I spotted a niche, really. And over the years, I, I've been very interested in writing about well, what it means to use technology well, you know, what the word well means in the context of technology and what it means to have discussions around technology that aren't just obsessed with gadgets, hardware, software in the present tense, but that are interested in people, human-machine interactions, and things like the ethics of this. I guess it's a bit of hand-waving, really. It kind of gives me permission to talk in ways I find interesting about how technology exists in our lives and the real world, rather than just treat it as a, a device or a bit of software in isolation. Mm, do you think that there's enough of that kind of contextualization in our culture, enough of a pause for thought to think, okay, well, how do we use technology in a way that serves our humanity in the broadest possible sense, and whatever that means for us individually and also as a society? I think we're getting a lot more of this than we used to 10 years ago. And of course, what's going on is that technologies, mobile phone, internet, and so on, have over the last 20 years gone from almost nothing to being ubiquitous. And there's always a time lag with this. There's this interesting period when a technology is new, when we don't really know what it is and what the sort of networks of unforeseeable consequences will be. Mm. And so gradually, as it becomes a part of life, I think the debate naturally shifts from what are these crazy gadgets going to do? And maybe they're all evil or maybe they're all great or maybe they're going to change the world completely. And then it shifts from that to one of observation. What are people actually doing with this? What is actually going on? What are some of the things that we didn't foresee but might now want to mitigate? And in a way, I like the idea of trying to help shape this debate in a small way, I suppose, but also of trying to be a little bit better prepared. But I think it's true to say that we are now moving from the, if you like, age of fantasies when we really fantasized about technology being all bad or all good, it just transforming the world at a click, to the realm of observation, when we're talking much more about how real people actually are using technologies in a lot of different ways and applying some of the more you know, traditional disciplines, sociology, politics, philosophy, aesthetics, and so on. We're, we're kind of bootstrapping these into the 21st century. Mm, it's a really interesting way of looking at it. I think also because technology often in all its guises can be quite seductive in this tendency that we have to play with a new toy, not really realising its potential, not really contextualising it, you know, thinking about things like its impact on 
the course of uh, the future, etc. And then we just get so seduced by the thing itself that we forget to actually ask these questions until a bit further down the line. Seductive is a great word. There's, there's a line from Sherry Turkle hmm. that I steal and constantly find myself quoting, which is that technology is seductive where it meets our human vulnerabilities. Hmm. And as it turns out, we are very vulnerable indeed. And I like the word seduction because it suggests the intensely emotional relationship we have with technology and the emotional relationships we have through technology. I think one of the big category errors is to talk about people as users and consumers yeah. with the implication that we're kind of rational decision makers and the question is to what degree technology empowers our kind of rational individualistic decision making when in fact we are messily wonderfully human and the degree to which technology shifts the scope of our behaviors and I think everyone is now becoming more and more aware of the degree to which you know the systems and the options that we inhabit hugely shift our behaviors and our attitudes you know a system that if you like is biased in favor of intense rapid emotion mm. is very different to a system that is biased in favor of quality slow feedback high commitment contacts and so on and perhaps a little bit belatedly, I think we're learning that there's not just one set of human behaviors full stop. There is this very complicated interplay between us, each other and the systems. And really, it's only through understanding this that we can look forward slightly, hopefully, in terms of getting the best out of ourselves and building, if you like, the best possible tools in terms of their human effects. Mm. Such a lovely summation. I think also one of the areas that I'd like to explore a little bit right now is something that you, um, a quote that you pull actually in your book, Critical Thinking. It's a wonderful quote by Karl Popper, who's one of the great philosophers of science. And you quote him as saying, if we are uncritical, we shall always find what we want. We shall look for and find confirmations and we shall look away from and not see whatever might be dangerous to our pet theories. Um, and I wonder, especially within a technological framework, the ways in which um, this plays out, whether you think that we're starting now to contemplate maybe the things that we don't see, that we choose to ignore. So that could be anything from the filter bubbles that lock out certain types of content or political views, or whether that might be ways of relating to people, ways in which technology allows us to not really fully connect and be met and be recognised and be present with one another. Um, in what way do you find that technology plays a role in helping us to be uncritical? I think Popper is one of the great thinkers for the present moment mm. because, among other things, he was obsessed with the possibility of falsification as a you know, criterion for progress in the sciences and thought. And connected to this was his idea that a healthy society – I suppose a healthy individual life within a society was one in which people were confronted with a diversity of views and in which people did more than simply seek confirmation of their pet theories. And I think one of the great challenges we face at the moment is, if you like, a collusion between our individual intense desire for confirmation, for the comfort and ease of finding our pet theories and biases and preferences confirmed, mm. and technology that gives us what we want, and technology that is algorithmically geared, you know, we use words like filter bubbles and echo chambers and so on, and what we imply by this is that we have constantly redisplayed to us information that fits in with our preferences and likes. And we are unaware of or don't even need to see the existence of stuff that contradicts us. It's not straightforward because there's also miraculous serendipities and encounters out there. But I think one of the great dangers is that when faced with you know, infinite information, we are each free to pick out only the like minds and then to team up with them and spend all our time talking about how everybody else is an idiot or worse. 
um, and to never submit any of our theories or preferences or beliefs to a genuine challenge. One of the reasons the idea that confirmation was such a dangerous thing in, in Popper's account is that there is no final destination for progress. There is no single perfect accurate account, no final answer that will satisfy everyone forever and ever. Mm. And so instead what we hope is that our current ideas will compete vigorously in an effort to explain the world and be useful and powerful and help human societies rather than drive them to the brink of ruin. And this can only happen, or it can best happen, if you have what he called an open society, uh, which is an idea that you know John Stuart Mill would have been very familiar with, where you have a free and frank battle of ideas, and people encounter and are challenged by lots of different perspectives. And the ability to express these different perspectives is itself protected and enshrined in the kind of structures of democratic debate and so on. And really the very pernicious opposite of this is a society where everyone is in their own private discussions unaware of what is going on. And if you like, a very small class of people are potentially able to hijack or misrepresent public debate. And instead of the vigorous free clash between ideas and the subjecting of them to scrutiny, what you have is just battles in which nobody is listening to anybody else, in which the end result is achieved through manipulation and intolerance rather than any kind of meaningful testing, and where also very vocal minorities can potentially silence or censor majorities because of the way in which they can mobilize people around their particular ideology. And I'm not saying that, you know, oh, everything's dreadful, isn't it terrible, everything's disastrous at the moment, but there are real kind of structural challenges. And a lot of these challenges are rooted in, if you like, the, the accidents and consequences of business models that are centered around giving people what they want, giving people new stuff on the basis of the old stuff they like, and making money from buying and selling attention irregardless of the content of the utterances, the content of the content, if you like, that is being used to gather that attention. It's fascinating. It's almost like giving people what they want instead of perhaps what they need. And possibly what we need is to design a space, like a, an intellectual commons, if you will, where we can have this sort of debate and bring it back into the heart of, of public discourse instead of it being, I suppose, designed out. Do you think that such... Um, a structural shift would be something that people would welcome? And how might we go about doing that? I think what people want is not static. So I want some things when, for example, you put me under time pressure, mm. distract me a lot and scare me. And I want very different things if I am in a slower space with friends, if I'm receiving cues, if you like, around things like trust and responsibility rather than commercial opportunity, envy and desire. So I think at the start, it's really a mistake to just say that people want stuff full stop. So why shouldn't they have it? You know, there's a very, if you like, kind of strong libertarian argument, which is be respectful of people's wants, be respectful of people's desires, don't patronize them. And there's a truth in this. But one of the important facts for me is that our wants and desires and needs don't just sit there like a big lump that actually the environments, the interactions, the situations we're in really quite profoundly shape what it is that we want, if you like, or what wants we call forth. So I guess what I'm saying is we need a variety of types and textures of time and space that it can be quite alarming when people spend all of their time inhabiting a particular mode that is perhaps very, very nervous and fast, very depleted in terms of energy and willpower that is very much geared up to be envious or fearful or embattled. You know, I'm talking in part about some experiences of social media. Mm. And I think, you know, people aren't like that full stop. There's not some immutable truth about human nature contained in this that we just need to face up to. I think what we need to face up to is that we're very plastic. We're very malleable 
we are vulnerable, but also strong and marvelous. You know, the same people can behave in ways that would, if you like, deeply disappoint them under certain circumstances. And then face to face with people in higher commitment scenarios do amazing things. For this reason, I'm very interested in thinkers like Luciano Floridi, who is a tech philosopher of ethics, um, a very, I think, influential philosopher in his field, who argues that we need to talk about the ethics of information environments. That is what these environments encode as an ethic, as an approach. And what does it mean to design a pro-ethical environment, which is an environment that encourages us to be more ethically responsible, to take responsibility, to debate serious questions, as opposed to, if you like, an environment that is interested in nudging us as quickly as possible towards very rapid, very little considered decisions on the basis of very, very kind of limited or distorting information, you know, reducing other people to the level of thumbs up, thumbs down, got this, got that, labels. It's very hard for you to be a good person in that kind of a situation. This, this kind of thinking about ethics and its role in the ways in which we design platforms, I think is something which is garnering a bit more attention now than it has in recent years. Do you think that there, there are any exciting platforms or technologies or ways of deploying the current technology that we have that is moving more in that direction, that is considering um, the ethical fabric of the platform or even designing it as a central was a central value in order to kind of create something which is quite different to what we've previously been exposed to. This is where I start to sound like an old fart, in <laughs> sense, which is a British expression. I don't know if American audience will think I'm being very bizarre in that I don't spend a lot of time kind of hanging out in and seeking new spaces. Mm. I spend a lot more time trying to seek a little bit of time and space for clearer thought. One of the things that does interest me is the vigor of the kind of long reads, long form, long debate movement. You know, anybody who thinks it's all about fast clicks is, isn't paying attention because there is very obviously a hunger for long, serious content that is not just to do with freshness and impact. But I suppose the point I always make when we're talking about things like this is more that the human appetite for meaningful connection is not defined by what goes on purely on screen. Mm. And some of the most positive stuff is the way that more and more we are you know, linking our on-screen activities to real world commitments, that the importance of meeting up with people in person, the importance of not just rebroadcasting every single moment of your life and doing everything for the sake of performance, but really achieving a variety of states of setting aside different types of time from important people, important ideas. I think as people grow up digitally, it's completely wrong to say that they just click all the time and don't notice the difference. I think actually younger people are really kind of fighting to assert quite subtle new norms of variety and control in order to not just be one dimensional. And of course, a lot of this goes on inside social media. You could look at something like the Me Too hashtag mm. as an example of injecting a deep ethical seriousness into social media and letting people know that they are not alone in the best sense, in the sense of giving people permission to speak, in terms of creating spaces for very, very thoughtful, difficult, troubling and personal content. And so, you know, these spaces have tremendous potential I think a deterministic account of technology is always wrong. Mm. A deterministic account is where you say that the technology has certain features and these features inevitably shape what people do and what happens next. And I feel this doesn't tell the story of what is going on in the real world, mm. where people are seeing what they can do with tools, testing their limits, creating new kinds of behavior, adopting or not adopting new features and tools, and generally speaking, profoundly shaping the future of technology by human choices and debates and actions. Mm. And it is very dangerous to only look at the big picture and be a determinist about tech because you lose sight of the fact that all of the decisions on a design level and on a usage level are still individual human decisions. And although 
on the small scale, people can look like they're not powerful, like they're being controlled by the tools. Actually, on the larger scale and in the longer term, again and again, I think we see their decisions shaping and changing usage. So I'm very help, hopeful when I see how people are kind of hacking systems and creating spaces, what they find important and really demanding that these things are noticed and talked about and surfaced rather than just glossed over. Mm. It's almost like a pushback to the ways in which we've we've been encouraged to use certain platforms. So I remember with when Twitter first came out, the hashtag was something which was user generated. It was a user that came up with it. If we're thinking about technology and how it can enable us to thrive depending on the ways in which we choose to engage with it. Um, and I know that this is a theme that you've written about, you know, in, in a lot of your work, how to thrive in a digital age. I'm curious, uh, especially as a dad, <laughs> uh, what values you live by or principles you live by that enable you to take more of this kind of thriving approach? I guess one of the things is a very basic point about not treating other human beings as objects. Mm. And this is a very basic principle of ethics, but the fact that these are real people living real lives. And when you disagree with people, the reasons are more complex than the labels you apply to that, and often for that reason, more upsetting and difficult. Um, and when you agree with people, again, you know, the labels, the groups can, can take you away from the most interesting aspects of that. And so I guess as a starting point, I'm interested in well, what it means to remember that there are people behind all of these interactions. And that can be very troubling and disappointing. You know, I was talking about positive things on, on Twitter and social media, but of course there are tremendous amounts of trolling, anonymous abuse, all of the stuff that is good about sort of hashtags and movements can be used to amplify what is bad and disappointing and bullying and appalling as well. Mm. And often tech companies don't do enough to step up. And so in a way, I think as often with an ethically rigorous approach. It's not about being kind of cheerful and sunny. In a way, it's about facing up to the ways in which people are disappointing and the circumstances under which they treat other people very, very badly, in which they dehumanize each other, in which our capacity for empathy and compassion is sort of can seem horribly limited. And I suppose in some ways, I'm what you might call a virtue ethicist, which is a nice little philosophical term, which really means that you are interested in the habits that are conducive to goodness and kindness and good behaviors. And I think it also implies that you don't think of treating people well and sort of goodness and the ethically positive as something that individuals do through acts of willpower, mm. through being kind of marvellous and productive and, and happy and eating lots of muesli and going jogging, and kind of becoming <laughs> super efficient, good, wonderful, super double plus humans. Mm. In, instead, you're really interested in the ways in which we are vulnerable, the ways in which we are limited and the ways in which we're egotistical and selfish and saying, well, then behaving well tends to be a long-term aspiration which you achieve alongside others by having a series of guidelines, by having a series of habits, by having a community of practice. I think one of the most important habits you can practice is empathy, uh, which is a word that my, my friend Roman Krasnaric has written about a lot recently. Um, the idea that empathy is perhaps a better starting point than judgment, not because people don't do terrible terrible things, but because drawing a line between you and them and saying that they are appalling as well as their acts is really to opt out of the clash between ideas from which sort of progress can come and also to opt out of the idea, well, under what circumstances can these people who do these things behave differently or can this be avoided in future? 
And so, you know, I'm really interested in, if you like, the kind of design principles for better behavior. And I think there's a big thing here about time, a big thing about the spaces in which people conceive of each other as human beings rather than objects. I think, unfortunately, also, there's, you know, some really big limitations to what we can do individually, that, you know, one needs to campaign on issues to do with things like equality, to do with things like the ethical designer systems, to do with things like, you know, the functionings of democracy and civil liberties and, you know, this infrastructure of ethically informed, rigorous, inclusive debate. If we don't have that infrastructure, it's going to be very hard to live good lives. So when we're talking about ethics and uh, the way in which it can inform design, I'm curious to maybe sense out a little bit the balance of responsibility, where that comes in and whose responsibility it is to engage with one another in an ethical way. So obviously, if we have technology that is designed to elicit certain behaviours, to fragment attention, to limit things to quite binary interactions, so likes, not likes, or whatever it might be, um, how much is it the responsibility of the people doing the designing? How much is it the responsibility of the individual in the ways in which we engage with that technology? Um, and also of, of societies of creating um, maybe guidelines or rules that help govern what can and can't be done. Um, yeah, where, how, how do you think the responsibility falls in these various different ways? I think a great deal of responsibility falls into the design stage of the process because once something is designed and out there, it has a momentum that can be very hard to challenge and disrupt. And we've had good debates in particular around things like AI, which has the benefit, if you like, that people are very scared of it. <laughs> and that may sound counterintuitive, but what I mean by that is that people are prepared to have debates about the ethics of AI because the idea of autonomous killer robots <laughs> is pretty scary, as it should yeah. be. And Nick yeah. Bostrom and others have sketched out some quite robust principles, I think, which says that in the instances of algorithms, they should be predictable to a degree, in that if you're going to have any ethical conversation about their consequences, any regulation and so on, you need there to be a degree of predictability. Otherwise, you're just throwing your hand in the air and saying, well, I'm sure this computer will produce the right answers and I don't need to understand them. Yeah. And then you need transparency to inspection. And this is very important because we don't often achieve it. I think transparency to inspection is a very important principle because it acknowledges that any you know, meaningful assessment of a system and what people are doing needs to be transparent because we can't possibly anticipate what's going on. We need to talk about how it is arriving at answers. And of course, there's a very profound asymmetry in most of social media between what people know and what the system knows about them. Yes. And I think this asymmetry is a very deep problem because you know there may or may not be pernicious worrying or just silly things going on you know, when it comes to people's decisions, the way they treat each other, the way they vote, what they think is going on in the world. But we have very, very few insights into this. So it makes it extraordinarily hard to debate in any meaningful way. There needs to be accountability to users, because broadly speaking, you tend to get good results from automated systems. And by good results, I mean ones that improve over time according to sort of measures of, of what people are getting out of them that align with their stated incentives rather than sort of serving a covert agenda. You tend to get good results if there is meaningful iteration. Mm -hmm. If you look at the outputs a system is produces, have a debate about those outputs, how they were arrived at, and then tweak and improve. And if there's accountability in the sense that if an algorithm decides that I should go to jail, that I haven't paid my tax, that I'm a bad teacher or a good teacher, that I'm a parent who's putting their child at risk, or so on. Well, I need to be able to have that justified to me in terms I can understand mm. and defend myself against those charges, not because I'm right and because the machine's wrong, but because that is a prerequisite of justice and fairness as we understand it. And we're coming to realize, I think, that there are very big problems in, if you like, the social contract 
when you have inscrutable systems arriving at unchallengeable decisions through incomprehensible means with very little possibility of iteration and with a very small, if you like, expert class of people who claim to know what is going on yes. but are unable to explain it or alter it. You know, none of these things is good in any conventional sense. And that's a, a shame because there is a tremendous evidence base around the very great good that automated systems can produce. You know, if you look at fields like medicine and so on, you know, the ability to assist physicians with diagnoses, to you know, support very sophisticated checklists, to look out for warning signs. If you look across the social sciences, our ability better to understand and operate our economies, our politics and so on. But I think we have to be a bit humble. You know, a kind of mythology about the smart machine that solves problems is, is really damaging and dangerous because it's, as it were, it is insufficiently modest about what machines can do, insufficiently complementary about what humans can do, and kind of willfully ignorant about the kind of processes, oversight and transparency that really are just basic prerequisites of a just, equitable, fair, ethical process, which produces good results for society over time. And the last thing I'd say is, you know, the disempowerment of people, and if you like, kind of elite technocratic arrogance, is becoming a huge political issue. You know, I think we're going to see people standing on populist no-robots platforms. Mm. And this Manichaean politics of machine bad, machine good, you know, total surveillance or technocratic solutions and so on, you know, there is nothing to like about that. It's going to produce bad outcomes. Mm. You know, the rise of populism in general is bad for politics because it dispenses with evidence-based, fair, inclusive debate and replaces it with ideologically intolerant rabble rousing. Yeah. And when you lose that ability to have good feedback, whether in machines or in the political system, you really lose the ability to genuinely debate the good, the bad, the mixed complexities of policies and technology and improve it over time. And so you make things worse for everybody in all kinds of ways. So what would you say is your greatest concern for the future? I suppose the most basic concern is through the lens of technology that it increases rather than decreases inequality and exclusion. And thus, it plays into the hands of populists and authoritarians who are more interested in power than getting things right. Yes. And of course, this is important because you know, if one genuinely believed that a kind of populist or enlightened dictator like in Plato's philosophy you know, was the best thing for a society, or that we should hand everything over to super smart machines because human makes mistakes, then maybe you'd be saying this is great. But I think it's a very dangerous form of delusion to you know, put our faith in individuals, in kind of ideologically pure parties or in super machines because of this point that Popper makes, because of the fact that actually we're only going to keep making things a little bit better or debating what better means by having the free clash between multiple perspectives, by being evidence-based, by being able to face up to the actual consequences of our tools in the real world and debate them meaningfully. The denial of reality is not a good strategy for survival. Mm. You know, you look at things like environmentalism, we face all kinds of horribly complicated, wicked problems around anthropogenic climate change, around food supplies, around water. We have the tools and the knowledge to deal with these things, and we have the tools and knowledge to debate them in an honest and productive manner. But if instead we are devoting ourselves to the denial of reality and to debates that are about ideologies and people and which kind of people you like rather than what is actually going on, then unfortunately, our hopes of surviving and thriving as a species are drastically reduced. Mm. So what would you say is your greatest hope for the future? Well, my greatest hope for the future is an incremental one, that in some places, at least, we manage to 
as we did during the, the first industrial revolution, you know, come up with forms of social practice, you know, ways, ways of living in a society that enable us to make better use of our astonishing innovations. And that means, I think, designing political systems, technological systems, human-machine interactions that bring out the best in us in terms of our ability to treat each other as people, in terms of our ability to face up to evidence, in terms of our ability productively to disagree and debate. And, you know, there are a lot of good laws being passed or being tried out. Uh, you know, the, for example, the new data legislation in Europe, which is a very boring topic, but it's also a very good example of, you know, it's imperfect and complicated legislation, but it places a great onus on technology companies to meet certain standards of responsibility and obligation towards their users. And the idea also of citizenship and data being entwined, of people not being users or consumers, but citizens mm. who have certain inalienable rights and responsibilities. You know, again, this is a very productive discourse. So, you know, I, in terms of progress, it is an incremental thing, but we can't afford to lose faith in people. We can't afford to think that people are weak and that they will be crushed by technology and the state. I think we need to recognize instead that there are situations in which we can arrive at outcomes that respect people as people that enhance their lives and possibilities mm -hmm. and that maybe in you know in some places in the world at least this is a realistic set of hopes for the next few decades okay so my last question to you if you could give people one action that they can take to fight for this future to create the kind of future that is more ethical, that doesn't erode, but rather enhance our humanity, what would that action be? I guess one of the most important actions is simply to seek out a greater diversity of views, mm. which is terribly easy to say. <laughs> and the thing I like about it is it's serendipitous. It's not a recipe for do this, do that. It's the idea that you know, if you are find that on social media you're following a whole bunch of people who all agree with each other, well, seek out people you disagree with from a greater diversity of backgrounds and ideologies, race, gender, geography, politics, and so on. Broadly speaking, I'm very influenced by, you know, Popper and Mill and others in the idea that one person standing up and saying, do this, this is right, it doesn't tend to be a great answer but a bunch of people standing up and saying, this is where we're coming from, listening to each other, vigorously debating, but genuinely seeking to understand each other's positions before they rebut them rather than shouting them down and silencing mm. them. Be very suspicious of your own intolerance, especially your own hidden intolerances. The more you disagree with someone, the more, in a sense, it's your duty to listen very carefully to the strongest version of the argument they're making. Because if you want to have any hope of countering that argument with genuine rigor, of genuinely changing their mind, of putting a really robust opposition to that argument into the world, you have to listen as carefully as possible to what's being said. The more you disagree, the harder you should listen. Thank you for listening to The Hive Podcast with me, Natalie Nahai. To find out more about today's guest and the topics we explored, you can find resources and links on the show notes page at natalinahai.com forward slash The Hive Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please do give us a rating on iTunes and join in the conversation with the hashtag Hive Podcast. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to sharing more with you in the next episode.